In this lesson, we're going to be learning how we know what atoms are like, how we know the way atoms behave, and how we got to the place we are today in our knowledge about atoms. But before we start, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you'll have easy access to all my chemistry lessons, tutorials, and chemical demonstrations. Now, even though this is a brief history of atoms, it's a long story, or better stated, it's a story that covers over thousands of years of history. In fact, our story starts in ancient Greece, well over 22 centuries ago, where a Greek philosopher named Democritus is thinking about the nature of nature. Since he was a philosopher, Democritus didn't actually do any science, but he still gave us an excellent idea. You see, before his time, most philosophers, including the famous Aristotle, thought that you could take a chunk of matter and cut it in half and cut that piece in half and cut that piece in half and keep cutting forever. They used to think that you could keep cutting and never get to a piece of matter that was an ultimately small unit. Well, Democritus challenged this idea. He said that if you took a piece of matter and cut it in half and cut that piece in half, and kept cutting each remaining piece in half, eventually you would get to a unit so small you couldn't cut it in half anymore and still have that element. And he called that ultimate unit of an, of an element atomos. And that's where we get our modern word atom. In fact, Democritus gave us our first contemporary definition of the atom. He said an atom was the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. And that's basically the same definition we use today. So if you took this apple pie and cut it in half and then kept cutting every half in half, well after about 85 cuts you would eventually get down to a piece of pie that had only one atom in it. But since Democritus wasn't a scientist, he didn't perform any experiments, and so his idea of atoms had to be shelved for a couple thousand years before anybody really took him seriously. Fast forward to the year 1774. A French tax collector named Antoine Lavoisier was also a chemist, and he enjoyed, so, uh, he enjoyed chemistry so much that he spent his spare time mixing and reacting and burning things. He built an impressive laboratory and had the money to commission some of the most precise measuring instruments that had ever been built up to that time. And Lavoisier discovered that when something is burned, the total mass of the products, the ash, the smoke, the vapors given off, is exactly the same as the total mass of the reactants, or the ingredients you started with. And he proved this. And so this idea that the mass that you start with is the mass you end up with is called the law of conservation of mass, sometimes called Lavoisier's law. Well, about 20 years later, in 1794, another French chemist named Joseph Proust was also making precise measurements, building on, on what Lavoisier had learned. But Proust was most interested in compounds, and he was able to demonstrate that for a chemical compound, the percentage mass of one element in the compound to the percentage mass of another element in the compound will always have a constant ratio. And this is called the law of definite proportions. So what this means is that if you find some water, it doesn't matter where that water comes from. It could be from the faucet in your kitchen, a bottle that you bought at the store, even from the Indian Ocean. All water will be exactly 88.9% oxygen and 11.1% hydrogen. It has that definite constant composition. Now, Joseph Proust took this revolutionary idea and studied common materials like foods. In 1799, for example, he studied the sugar in honey and compared it to the sugar in grapes. And he found that the sugar in both of these foods had the exact same chemical composition, which was quite a surprise to the scientists of his day. Well, just a few years later, in 1803, a British chemistry teacher named John Dalton 
put all these ideas together. The concepts from Democritus, Lavoisier, and Proust, and explained that the most reasonable explanation for all of them was that matter is made of these tiny particles called atoms. He explained why matter behaves the way it does in his atomic theory. And this atomic theory has four main parts. The first one is that all elements are composed of atoms. Now it sounds like he borrowed this idea from the Greek philosopher Democritus 2,000 years before him. The second part is that atoms can't be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. And this is based on Lavoisier's law, the law of conservation of mass. Once again, he explains why mass is conserved. Because mass is actually made up of these, of these little atoms that really don't go anywhere. They just get rearranged in a reaction. The third part is that all atoms of an element are identical to each other, but different from atoms of other elements. Now this was mostly his own idea. The last part is that all compounds have a constant ratio of atoms of elements, which once again was based upon Proust's law, the law of definite proportions. Here, Dalton explained why compounds don't vary in their mass ratios, because they're made up of this non-changing ratio of very specific atoms. Like water, for example, it's always two hydrogens and one oxygen, or as we sometimes say, H2O. Dalton's version of the atomic theory has stood the test of time, and it's still the foundation of how we think about atoms today. Well, except for one part. That third part? Well, we know today that not all atoms of an element are identical to each other. Because there are these things called isotopes, where a single element can have several different varieties. But that's something we'll talk about in another lesson. Really, the atomic theory was, in a way, ahead of its time. Dalton didn't have the instruments or the microscopes we have today. So Dalton's atomic theory was a huge step forward. But scientists that believed in atoms really didn't have much of a way to prove they existed. And even those scientists thought that atoms were these indivisible chunks or blobs of matter. In 1897, though, a British scientist named Joseph John Thompson used cathode ray tubes to discover that the cathode rays themselves had these very light negative charges. He extrapolated this idea to state that all atoms had these tiny negatively charged particles. He called these, these charges uh, cor uh, corpuscles, but today we call them electrons. So we say that J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. Now, being the good scientist he was, Thompson tried to visualize what atoms looked like. So in 1904, seven years after he discovered the electron, he imagined that the atom was mostly this blob of positively charged stuff with the negatively charged corpuscles, or the electrons, randomly scattered throughout, kind of like in this picture here. He said that the electrons were scattered randomly, like plums in plum a pudding. So his model came to be called the plum pudding model, which is kind of funny considering most people have never eaten plum pudding. Today we might compare it to uh, chocolate chips scattered throughout a chocolate chip cookie, quite random in fact. And so this was the model that came from J.J. Thompson. Well, about 11 years later, in 1908, two scientists named Robert Millikan and Harvey Fletcher performed an ingenious experiment with electrons called the oil drop experiment. They used this apparatus, which they used a little uh, bulb right here and some friction to, to electrically charge tiny droplets of oil. Then those droplets passed through an electric field inside the apparatus here and they were able to measure the charge of an electron. And when they did this, the charge of an electron turned out to be about this much, about 1.592 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. 
which is a very small charge in the macro world, but for such a tiny particle was actually really significant. And a side note, most textbooks and chemistry teachers called this the Millikan oil drop experiment, although today we know that Fletcher had probably just as big a role in the experiment. In fact, there's evidence that Robert Millikan convinced Fletcher to give up claim to the experiment. Either way, it was Millikan who was awarded the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physics for this experiment. Still, the plum pudding model was still the predominant model of the atom, until a scientist from New Zealand, Ernest Rutherford, smashed the plum pudding model once and for all in 1911. Rutherford designed the gold foil experiment, and this is where he shot extremely dense, positively charged particles called alpha particles at a very thin piece of gold foil. And so maybe we can draw a little picture of this just to imagine what's going on. Here's the piece of gold foil, and here's the little apparatus. This is very rudimentary, but he's shooting these little alpha particles at the gold foil. And Rutherford assumed that if the plum pudding model was correct, those alpha particles would pass straight through the gold foil. And most of them did. But one in every 10,000 or so alpha particles actually bounced off of the gold foil and was reflected right back at him or deflected at different angles. And that wasn't supposed to happen. You see, that's kind of like shooting a gun at a piece of tissue paper and having the bullet bounce off the paper. That just doesn't happen. But it did happen. So Rutherford started thinking and reasoning. He realized that the only way the dense alpha particles could bounce off of anything is if they hit something in those gold atoms that's also very dense and positively charged. So Rutherford realized that those gold atoms have a dense, positively charged region called a nucleus. Rutherford realized that the nucleus was very dense, but very, very tiny compared to the size of the entire atom. He called these positive charges in the nucleus protons. And so with one pivotal experiment, the gold foil experiment, that plum pudding model, which had been around for all of seven years, was smashed to pieces. It was gone. But still, there was more work to do. Just six years later, in 1917, a scientist from Denmark named Niels Bohr first discovered that electrons are found in specific energy levels. Now, Niels Bohr proposed that these energy levels were circular, kind of like this, and that the electrons were circling around the nucleus, much in the way that planets orbit the sun. In fact, it was thought that an atom was almost like a little miniature solar system. Although you've probably seen pictures like this of the Bohr model of the atom, it was later proven to be quite incorrect. Still, Bohr did discover energy levels, and he was also the first to realize that electrons can be in one energy level, they can be in another energy level, and they could even jump from one to another, but they can never hover in between energy levels. And this idea was the foundation for our modern model of the atom. Still, the model of the atom in the late 19-teens and early 1920s was incomplete. Take a look at this textbook I found at home, Fundamentals of Chemistry, a chemistry book published in 1924. And there's only one paragraph, this paragraph right here in the whole book, that talks about the nucleus of the atom. When it talks about the nucleus, this is what it says. It says little is known about the nucleus beyond the fact that it is electrically positive and is the more stable part of the atom which gives weight. In the smaller atoms, it is smaller than the electron but has practically all of the weight of the atom and thus is extremely dense. So they didn't know very much about the nucleus. They knew about protons 
They knew about electrons, but the last piece of the puzzle was set into place in 1932 by a British scientist named James Chadwick. He discovered that protons weren't sitting in the nucleus by themselves, but there were neutrons there too. These neutrons didn't have any charge, so they were neutral, hence the name neutrons. But neutrons were big. In fact, they were just as big as protons. In fact, they were a tiny bit larger than protons. So here, our story about the atom comes to close for now. We go from the humble beginnings of the atom as nothing more than a philosopher's conjecture, all the way to complex experiments determining exact masses and charges of protons, electrons, and neutrons. It was a long journey, and the story continues even to our day. If you like the story, give me a like and subscribe to my channel so you can come back and learn some more chemistry.